We're kicking off a new series called Home is Where the Heart Is. This is actually a, a, an old series that we haven't actually resurfaced in years and years. And uh, we were uh, about to do a DNA course. Uh, it's a, something we do before Sunday morning service every once in a while where we talk through uh, the vision, values, and mission uh, of this church and correlate it to our individual lives and how to express that in our world. And as I was preparing for a DNA course, I'm like, it might be worth just doing that with everybody. Uh, it might be worth taking a few weeks to talk about a life led by values and not just the blowing of the winds because the reality is, is that every home is made up of, of a series of values. I don't know what you value in your home, but I, I would assume the moment that I walked into your house, I could gather pretty quickly what you value, the aroma in the air of what kind of food you're eating, uh, the way the table's set, are you expecting people uh, if you got kids, you know for sure I got kids when you walk into our house. Uh, you know that my wife values cleanliness because we don't wear shoes in our house. We are those people. Hate us if you want to. We got like babies crawling around, you know, like keep your filth outside, man. Anybody? <laughs> but if I walked into your home, we could, over a short period of time, kind of gather what you value and when we're talking about values under this definition, this is a person's principles or standards of behavior. This is a good definition. One's judgment of what is important in life. And as a church, we have a set of values. We have a system that guides us. Uh, we treat those as more of a compass than a map. A lot of churches, and I've been guilty of this at certain times, where you get attached to the map of something. You feel like you have this sort of blueprint, if you will, and if things don't go according to plan, then God's not good. But how many know that maps change? If I were to give you a map of Arroyo Grande 100 years ago, you would have a hard time navigating Arroyo Grande. I remember growing up here my whole life when Sizzler was where the movie theaters are. You guys remember Sizzler? Rest in peace, in and out was an upgrade. I remember we, we used to have a carnival on the corner of Oak Park and Grand Avenue. Anybody remember that in that dirt lot, there was a carnival that would come to town on the corner of Oak Park and Grand where Rite Aid is. I remember pre-Walmart, I remember that my Aunt Jan checked my cousin Josh out of school on the first day that Walmart opened to get him to the grand opening. He missed school because of it. <laughs> and so values aren't a map, but they're more like a compass. Values are things that we carry and apply to our lives so we know true north. Because how many you know that the environment might change around us? That the times might get challenging around us, the relationships may come and go, things of this life will fluctuate, but our values can give us a sense of direction. It gives us a sense of what God has been saying and will say again. So values are more of a compass than a map. And we won't always have specifics, but we can know the direction that we're called, and I love Proverbs 4.23, it says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. How many know that in this day and age, the world is yelling in our ears to follow your heart? You guys hear this? Uh, it's a cultural phenomenon. It, it's something that's really popular on social media channels. If you're watching any sort of garbage television, I never do. I never watch The Bachelor. Most times I do. Um, Follow your heart. Do what you feel. How many know that that's not working? It's not going well. It all ends up in a pigsty. It's all an empty facade to just follow what we feel like doing. And so we have identified our values uh, to be the acronym HEART because we believe if you guard the heart of something, everything else will work itself out. We want to be the type of people that actually live from the inside out, not the outside in. Amen. So we choose to guard our heart, for it determines the course of your life. And these are, these are our values. Honor, I'm glorifying God in everything I do. Excel, I'm following Christ and becoming like him. Advance, I'm using my gifts to serve God's purpose. Reach out, I'm on a mission to reach the lost. Together, I'm formed with the family of God. Those, what we, are, we call our heartbeats, but... I just want to be really clear that these aren't just values of an organization. You know, people ask, what is Equippers Church? And I say, well, the people are Equippers Church. 
or we say around here, we are who we are. We are corporately, whatever the brand equipment is, whatever the name is, whatever it might be on a building, it, it's actually made up of people. My life and my wife and my children and our pursuits, that's Equippers Church. And your life and your family and your pursuits and your business, that's Equippers Church. We are corporately, we are individually. So when I talk about these values, it's, it's not just values of an organization. It's values that are hopefully embraced on a personal level because we believe in equipping people for life, not just equipping people for church. <laughs> Can we just make that distinction? We're not equip, equipping people for church in Jesus Christ. We're equipping people for life through faith in Jesus Christ. So I believe if, if we embody this set of values that uh, our, our relationships will be better, our careers will be better, our businesses, our relationships, everything in our lives, because if we guard the heart, everything else will work, work itself out. The other proverb that's key here is, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a dream fulfilled is a tree of life. And we often say that values are like the banks of a river. A river without banks is a swamp. But I don't know about you, but I want to have some sense of momentum in my life. There's some stuff that I want to see accomplished in my lifetime. There's some stuff I got in mind for my children that they could walk into. I don't know about you, but I don't just want to have a swamp for a living. I want to be in the river for a living. I want to be in the momentum of God. And what happens so much is that when, when, when our dream is unfulfilled, it makes our heart sick. And oftentimes, dreams are unfulfilled because we haven't set a value system in our life. We are blown and tossed by every new wind of teaching. Uh, COVID hits and you all of a sudden forsake community. Uh, you know, whatever else happens, you know, uh, it's uh, election year. So all of a sudden you, you, you got your boxing gloves on. <laughs> Guilty as charged. What I'm saying is that values are instrumental in actually seeing a dream fulfilled for a life, a church, and a family. And when those things are deferred, it actually makes our hearts sick. And so I hope that over the next few weeks um, that you start to feel health in your heart again, that you start to see some stuff come alive again. And specifically today, I'm going to talk about honor, the first and probably foundational heartbeat of this church and our lives as a family is, is honor. Honor means to highly esteem, means to give weight to something means to value it or to greatly respect it. But the definition we're using and always use in this context is to put weight behind. That's the biblical definition of honor, is to actually come behind something and add momentum to it, to add weight to it, to add glory to something is the biblical definition of honor. So a couple things. You ready? A couple things we honor. You ready? The word of God. First priority is we honor the word of God. Um, why do we honor the word of God? Because if we're not letting the word define God, we ourselves will define God. Anybody been with someone recently and, you know, there's something that's challenging for them to get their head around? They say, well, Jesus wouldn't be like that. Well, the Bible says he is. I don't have a choice in that circumstance. I actually have to let the word of God form me into God's image so I don't form God into my image. And so we actually put weight behind the word of God. It's, it's not just a task to check off in our day-to-day -day lives. It's something that we put weight behind. 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25 says, all people are like grass. It's so encouraging. <laughs> Their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Anyone just withering and falling but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. How many know that the Bible has what you need to be equipped for every good work? I, I, I'm all about self-help stuff. I, I love plans and you know, I love different strategies to help motivate me. But when it comes to being equipped for the life God has for me, I don't actually have to look beyond what Scripture has already said. 
I can find truth in the scripture. I can find strength in the scripture. I can find encouragement in the scripture. I can find boldness in the scripture. But the key here is, is that we don't just want to be hearers of the word, but we actually want to do doers of the word. John 8, 32, Jesus said, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. That word know there is, uh, it's a bit of an intimate word. Uh, that word know is actually like, like, like when you get married, you know, and you make it official. You know that person because you've been married and you made it official. Uh, it's experiential in nature. It is the application of something. This is the word no. And so it's not just about sitting through Sunday sermons. It's not just about your Bible app. It's about actually letting God speak to you and experience him through his word. And that truth that's experienced will actually set you free. It's actually in the application of truth that you know it. Amen? I think one thing that's really helpful in the process of putting weight behind the word of God, and this is a good litmus test for us, is, is asking this. When I have questions, where do I go? Just that simple question. When I have questions, where do I go? I, uh, I heard my neighbor, and I, I associated so closely with this. I don't know what was going ac across the street. There are friends, but it was classic. You know, the wife walks out the door, and she looks back and loudly, just don't start Googling stuff. I'll figure it out. <laughs> You know that one? <laughs> like when something's wrong, you're just like Googling everything in the whole world that could, and then it turns out you're going to die because you had a scab. That's Google. <laughs> I love professionals. I love the help. But like when I have questions, where do I go? Do I go to the word of God to define reality for me or do I let other people define that for me? When I have questions, where do I go? And this is three ways that we actually put weight behind the word of God is in daily devotions. I'm a firm believer uh, in morning devotions. Uh, Jesus did it. Uh, if you're not a morning person, I'm so sorry. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> Jesus did it. Um, along this principle, this is for me. You don't have to be like this. It's just for me. I, I really want to hear from God before I hear from other people. I uh, now have four children, and... Um, some of, Davey's like real sweet when he wakes me up, you know. He comes in with his blankie like over his head. And he just walks in real quietly. And, uh, Dad, hey, buddy, good morning. Got some more milk, Dad. Sure, buddy. I'll be right there. And then he'll just walk off like quietly. And I won't even get him milk. He'll just go away. Um, <laughs> no fuss. And just another child who will not be named. <laughs> Dad! Like 5.30, doesn't, no care. It's like, boom, lights are on. Slapping on the back, the whole thing, just jumping in bed, ready to go. And I love her for it. <laughs> who will not be named. That's why we love her. That passion and grit. She's seen some stuff. <laughs> She's a morning person. Um, but it's just not the best way to start the day. Um, I, I actually try and make it a value and a priority to, to get up before they do, to actually spend some time with the Lord, whether it's five minutes, 30 minutes. Hopefully they start sleeping in again until it's an hour. Um, but just getting into the place where you pray, read a little bit of scripture, it doesn't have to be a ton, but you're creating an environment in your life and your world where you actually hear from God before you just start hearing from other people. And that might be a journey for people, but I believe it's something that should be practiced daily, that it's a, a rhythm that we get in um, to form relationship with God. I think it would be really silly uh, if every five days or so I, I had a conversation with my wife. But so many of us treat our relationship with God that way. Every once in a while, we'll touch base and we'll check in. And I, I might care what you have to say. But for me, if Jesus is really my highest relationship in my life, maybe it's not first thing in the morning. But at some point, I have to make it a value to keep connection with Jesus. To keep the conversation going. To remind him and pour my adoration on him. And to remind my soul 
who is Lord because I am quick to make myself God of my own life, if I'm honest. The other uh, way that we honor is through the preaching of God's word. Uh, This is the thousands of year old practice of the church to gather on a Sunday morning and Although I don't think rows are the only way the church should gather, I think actually circles are more effective, but this is the thing the church has been doing for thousands of years. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I I love through COVID, you know, we were tempted the same. We're like, it's time to reinvent the wheel, man. And then you start studying church history and not just your isolated little Central Coast life. And you're like, okay, maybe we don't touch the sacred (laughs) Maybe we don't change the thing that the church has been doing for thousands of years, gathering on a Sunday morning to worship and hear the word of God preached. Yeah. Uh, that's what we've been doing. That's what we're going to keep doing. But we don't just treat it as common or ordinary. We actually put weight behind the preaching of God's word. And that's when we say amen. That's when we uh, acknowledge the word of God. Uh, and the other thing is unpacking in e-groups or what we would call smaller settings. I love Uh, getting together with my guys on a Monday night and having an opportunity for questions to be asked. This isn't the best case scenario for someone who's just overflowing with questions, is it? (laughs) I mean, you're gonna hear truth and the Bible will be preached, but you need a setting and a safe space where you can start asking some questions. I met with a guy last Tuesday and we sat down. He's 19 years old, no real biblical history. And, uh, Every time we get together, I say, hey, just think of questions. You can just ask me questions, whatever it is. It's whatever it could possibly be. And he said, can you tell me about sin? I said, well, where do I start? And for about an hour, I taught this kid on a couch about sin. I mean, on a Sunday morning, someone doesn't raise their hand and said, hey, can you expound on the issue of sin for me? But you actually need a setting in your life where you are with people in community where the truth can be spoken and light could come to broken places. So we actually honor the word of God in e-groups, in small settings. And uh, there's new e-groups happening. That's a whole other Sunday. We'll be talking about that. But uh, we honor the word of God. Amen? Amen. The other, the next thing is that we actually honor people. Uh, This one's a a big deal because I actually have a firm belief that everyone deserves to be honored. And honor, if you look back on our biblical definition, is to put weight behind each other. And when we put weight behind someone, it actually gives acceleration and momentum to their life. I actually think that's what Jesus meant when he said, love your neighbor as yourself. This is really challenging because uh, we can love ourselves well, right? Like, The Lord spoke to me a few years ago about the dreams and visions that we had. We were in this sort of key financial phase or if we were going to try and buy a house or, you know, and it was really consuming. I was just overwhelmed and consumed with finance and, you know, this dream of having permanence for our family and the whole thing. And I was overwhelmed. And the Lord just said, can you desire that more for your neighbor than yourself for a little while? How many of us are challenged to actually prefer other people? Like, I, there's all kinds of stuff that I want in my life, but I think loving your neighbor as yourself is actually saying, I want that dream more for you than I actually want that for myself. I want your prosperity more than I want my own. I, I want your life to be effective and make a difference even more than mine. And what's so funny is we started implementing family game nights in our family, which five might be a little young because it's not going well so far. <laughs> we last about four minutes, you know. But it's it. we have every intention. We get together around the table, and every Friday night, we bring out a board game. And uh, What's so funny is that our oldest is five years old, so these are not intellectual beings yet. And they're so darn competitive. We're playing Candyland, which is pure luck. Just whatever color is on the card, you take your gingerbread man, and you put on that color, right? And everyone's real happy when they're ahead. But the vengeance and the aggression that comes out when someone else's gingerbread gets in front of that other person's gingerbread. They're five years old. (laughs) They have this competitive nature. Like, I don't want you to get ahead in life. But the sad thing is I think we do that as adults and well, as well. It's all good if it doesn't affect my world. As long as things are flourishing for me, I'm so sorry that it's happening to you. But I think actually to honor people is not just lip service, but to put our weight behind other people. Actually, to love people is going to cost me something. So I have to take some of my weight and put it behind you to bring acceleration to your life. And 
I think actually in reality, the honor we attribute to someone is directed to their effectiveness in any given environment. I'll explain in scripture. Mark 6, 4 through 6, Jesus told them a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, catch this, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them, which is still a great day. (laughs) But he was amazed at their unbelief. Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people. And so what we can gather here, Jesus, as God, is limited in a moment because people didn't have faith in who he was. There was actually a cap on what could take place that day because he was dishonored. I want to bring something to you that can be a little bit challenging is the definition of dishonored is actually just to treat something as common or ordinary. (laughs) To dishonor someone is just to treat them as common or ordinary. It's not blatant anti. It's not blatant aggression. It's not saying the wrong thing. It's just to treat someone as common or ordinary. So Jesus was treated ordinarily, and it put a cap on the miracles that could be done in a moment. I just wonder what could really happen in our homes and our businesses and our lives if we took the posture to treat no one as common. It's to treat everyone with some sort of honor, to give weight to their lives, to appreciate what God has gifted them and given them, to put a weight behind them so that they can be effective in an environment. I just wonder... um, if you're putting your weight behind the people around you in your life, or if you've ever even thought about it like that. Husbands, to your wives, if I can poke the bear, she's got all kinds of stuff on the inside of her that God wants to release, that she needs to flourish, and you have the ability and the environment that you create in your home to put weight behind your wife to see dreams fulfilled in her heart. Can I say maybe the most weight of anybody in her world is you coming alongside, coming behind her and pushing her right into the very thing God has called her to do. But it costs you something. In your workplace, as a boss, as a manager, when's the last time that you came under somebody who was maybe lower on the totem pole and you just added weight to their life? Hey, I wanna see you succeed. And I'm actually gonna... It's going to cost me something, and there will be sacrifice involved, but I actually want to see you succeed. This is how we honor people. It's not just empty lip service. It's putting weight behind lies because we actually believe that people matter. Amen? Amen. And uh, I think the thing that most commonly robs us of our ability to honor is um, comparison. Paul had something to say about that in 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13. He said, We do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they're not wise. We, however, will not boast beyond our proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the sphere of service God himself has assigned to us, a sphere that also includes you. I just hope that you don't let comparison rob you of taking hold the key of honor to unlocking the kingdom around your life. I don't know about you, but oftentimes, um, you know, we, we make a really good effort of showing our best selves. And it's a weird way that humanity these ways, we just project the best of ourselves to other people and not let them into the real person of who we are. I, I've said this over and over again, but studies have shown that the American dream has actually changed. The American dream used to be that you really did have a white picket fence, is that you really did have things, that there was something behind your name in a bank account somewhere, there there was something tangible. Now, the American dream, it's been proven, is just to be perceived as someone who has something. You don't actually have to have anything, but as long as people perceive you as a person of prosperity and wealth, that is the dream fulfilled in America. And that's sad. But but can't you see how fragile of a world that's creating at the moment? (laughs) If anyone just saw who I really was, if anyone actually saw that I don't have it all together, if anyone saw that I actually have no clue what I'm doing as a parent, (laughs) if anyone had any clue of my past and my pain and my failures, but you know that's where the people of God step in. 
And we're able to give real honor where honor is due to people in their true condition, not just the condition they're showing themselves to be. We get into the real stuff, and the people of God still choose to honor people beyond because we're not just comparing ourselves among ourselves. We have a sense of security. And uh, I love this, Matthew 15, 8. If you needed it shot straight, here it is. <laughs> These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their hearts are far from me. I don't know about you, but there is times in my life where I need God to reset my heart towards people. I know I'm a pastor, and I'm supposed to just love people and do that perfectly all the time. <laughs> I can tell you, sometimes it goes that way. But a lot of the times, none of you, obviously, but there are people who make this a little more challenging, right? You're just trying to be a good Christian out there. Do your very best to, to love everybody, and then someone comes along and they undermine everything you've set your hand to. There's people who, who backstab you, who say things that are completely inappropriate and false. There, there's people who come along and they try to trip you up in the pursuit of what God has for you. And as Christians, I think we're the most guilty of just, bless you, you know. Just put a smile on, slap that mask on for a few more moments because Sunday's almost over and you could get home and the pillow talk tonight will be tragic. Nobody? Or say, God, I don't just want to honor people with my lips. I want to honor people with my heart. I actually want pure intention towards other people. I actually want the best for everyone in my world. I actually want to live free and lightly and not clinging on to the things that grieve the very spirit of God. So let's get practical when it comes to honoring people. Can we just quickly, uh, maybe this week you need to make a phone call. Uh, maybe you need to write a letter. Anyone gotten a letter in the mail recently? I don't think anything speaks more volumes of care than a handwritten letter. Um, Jack Occhiano will write those for you. His handwriting is beautiful. Right? It was so sweet the other day. He was writing letters for Johnny, not to put you on blast, but if you get a letter from me, it's not my handwriting. It's for five-year-olds. I promise my kids wrote that. <laughs> but I just want you to really imagine, like, the honor you place behind someone's life this week could unlock miracles. It could just nudge them right into the place where God wants them to be where everyone else is heaping judgment on their life. Maybe you're the person who comes along and puts weight behind their life to excel them into what God has for them. Amen? A text, a phone call, whatever it might be to nudge people into what God has for them. And the other thing we honor is the presence of God. The band can come up. We're going to wrap up today. Uh, we honor the presence of God. We love in Exodus 33, verse 12 through 16. Um, if you need a little backstory on Moses, he was a, a phenomenal leader, and he was responsible for a people group who had been pursuing a promised land. They had an objective in mind to get to the place that they'd been fighting to get to for a very long time, way longer than it should have taken. And Moses is now responsible for this people group, and uh, he, he has this encounter with the Lord, this dialogue with the Lord in Exodus 33, and he says to the Lord, you have been telling me to lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you'll send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you're pleased with me, teach me your way so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. And the Lord said, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said, this is so profound what Moses says. If your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? Moses takes this beautiful posture. And I, I really want to paint this for you because it's so powerful is that Moses was on the edge of getting what he'd been wanting. I mean, the Lord says in Exodus 33, go, go to the promised land. Go to the land flowing with milk and honey. Go ahead. But I'm not going to go with you. Moses is like, hold up. It's not worth getting the thing I wanted if God doesn't go with me. The 
It's not worth the accolades. It's not worth the success. It's not, you know how terrible that milk and honey would be without God? (laughs) He says, "I'm, I'm willing actually to lay that dream down if God doesn't go with me. I want that sort of conviction in my life. I want that sort of value system running at the core of who I am. Because there will be moments and temptations to do things, believe it or not, without the presence of God. Because some of you are pretty darn clever. You're pretty smart people. And you can make spreadsheets do stuff that I have no clue how to make them do. You're smart. You went to school. There's all kinds of stuff that would say that you're fit to take the next step in the direction that would propose that you have gained some level of success. I hope you find that. But if we can learn anything from Moses, all that stuff is not worth it without God himself. And can I just say this? The presence of God actually guarantees our success. And it'll frustrate your mind because there'll be moments when things are exactly the opposite of what you intended the presence of God to attribute to. I remember sitting in hospital rooms for the first six months of our five-year-old's life. We spent about three months in the hospital. She was really sick with a rare condition and, you know, potentially not going to make it. And those things aren't good. (laughs) They aren't fun. They're potentially really tragic, but I just remember Stanford Hospital multiple times, and we would bring a little speaker. We had this Bose wireless speaker, and we'd put the speaker on and didn't care who was coming in and out of the hospital room. We had worship playing. When our kids were born, French Hospital, we had that little speaker, that same little speaker, just playing worship music. And the, so how many know that chaos can be all around me? <laughs> but if God's with me, It's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So we have a high value for the presence of God. And I love how he said, if God, if your presence doesn't distinguish us, we're just going to be like anybody else. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be just like anybody else. I hope leading a church that is never interpreted as like a club or just a, a, a fun group of people or you know, some sort of elite society that's benevolent to other people, I would hate to be distinguished that way. I hope that the thing that is known most about us is the presence of God. I went to church, don't remember the songs, don't remember what the guy said, but I felt something. And that thing was the actual presence of God himself as he responds to faith and hunger. So I want the presence of God to distinguish my life. We, we value his presence because it's precious. It's what identifies us. In the context of church, if I could speak into that for just a moment, we place a really high value on praise and worship. We've, it's not just the songs we sing to get to the other stuff. It's actually the primary call of the church historically is to worship first. We say in We see in Psalm 100 that you enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Why do we start services with songs every Sunday? It's how you get into the presence of God. (laughs) Psalm 89 said, blessed are the people who know the passwords of praise. So I I wanna encourage you, if worship sometimes get familiar to you, don't miss out. If this circle of rhythm gets too familiar. We just go to church on Sundays. It's just what we do. And I remind you that you're invited into the very presence of God with a bunch of other broken people who have been forgiven and redeemed. And it is scandalous what God allows to happen here on a Sunday morning. You and your muck and mire are in the presence of a holy God. (laughs) How do you get in? You get in thanksgiving and praise and I love this thought, what you don't bring, you actually have to borrow. (laughs) So on your way to church next time, bring something. Bring thanksgiving. Bring an overflow of how faithful God's been. 
Maybe contemplate when you're walking through the doors of his faithfulness towards you in your life. So that when you step into an environment like this on a Sunday morning or wherever else you worship with people, I have this note. It's the only note that's locked up in the top of my notes on my phone. It just says, be the most thankful person in the room. I got every reason for God to hate me. <laughs> I'm so thankful that he still loves me. <laughs> I'm so thankful that when we sing songs, we lift our hands, his presence comes. I'm, I'm so thankful that he allows us to be participants in his kingdom. I'm so thankful that he's given us the means somehow to be generous and benevolent in our community. We don't deserve any of that stuff. I'm so thankful that my wife is still with me. She probably shouldn't have been. I want to be the most thankful person in the room. Why? Because thanksgiving attracts the presence of God. Amen. And if, you know, if people were to ask, well, if God's presence is already here, you know, why, why do anything? I love this in, in Exodus 33 again. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. That's powerful. But this when other people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent, they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance to their tent. No one decided in that moment that just Moses was meeting with God. They didn't just spectate and say, hey, it's really cool what's happening for him over there. No. Oh, God just responded. God's here. He's chosen to meet with Moses in that tent, and they would all come out of their tents, and they'd begin to worship God. Why? Because they went on in on him. Participants in the glory of God, not just spectators. And at this church, I would just ask that we make the commitment to not just be thermostat, thermometers, but thermostats. What do I mean by that? It's really easy to come into a given environment. You can do this in your home, your business, whatever. You kind of go, uh, ooh, as many people here this Sunday. <laughs> I don't really like that song. Dang, I usually sit there. <laughs> Why does John lead worship again? <laughs> My God. <laughs> Didn't they use those graphics already? <laughs> That's easy. Thermometer, easy business. You know what we're called to? Thermostats. What does the thermostat do? A thermostat sets the temperature of a room. You come in. Oh, I really don't like this song. <laughs> I'm going to worship anyways. I actually believe that my worship makes a difference for the people around me. I actually believe that my worship on the front row is more powerful actually than the team on the stage. I actually believe that my singing next to whoever I'm sitting next to is unlocking freedom over their life. I actually believe that as I step out in faith, it's giving permission for other people around me to step out in faith. I believe that when I lay hands on the sick, and I don't just take a temperature, man, this is really dire, this is really challenging. No, but I build up faith in my inner world, and I begin to lay hands on the sick. It gives permission for other people to lay hands on the sick and see them made well. So we just make that commitment in our homes, in our businesses, in our school, wherever you're called to in your life. Can you just commit? I'm a, I'm a thermostat not just taking the temperature because we put our weight behind the presence of God. God loves the janky songs. God loves the stinky person. God, whatever it might be, he looks at the heart, never the outward appearance. So we honor those things. We honor the word of God. We honor the people of God. We honor the presence of God. Would you stand with me as we close? eyes closed and head bowed, here's the, here's the reality is that one of the things that robs our, our honor so quickly is familiarity. Um, if you've ever been in a relationship or known another human, the, the first moments sort of wear off, don't they? I've told story after story of what I did to woo my wife broke the bank to get that girl. I've told story after story of the encounter
encounters with God in my youth being laid out before him night after night I remember Josh France and I working on the estuary late in the night just praying worshiping contending for revival on the central coast I remember these things where God first captivated my heart then sometimes familiarity creeps in, you know, in your relationships, unfortunately with our relationship with God sometimes, start to treat things as common, just ordinary. My hope, my cry today, as we gather anything from these moments together, is that God would restore honor to our lives, that we wouldn't treat his word as common or ordinary it would be bread it would be life it would be sustenance the word of God would be the only truth the only place where our hope is found the word of God for people Lord I ask that you'd restore honor towards people one to another God that this church these people would be stupid committed to putting weight behind each other sacrificial love would be personified and expressed where the world would know we're different because of the way we love one another we honor we put weight behind and ultimately God wherever your presence has gotten common or ordinary we repent turn back towards you and we just confess this is this is wild the presence of a holy God come on if you're able to just lift your hands for a moment acknowledging his presence whether you feel like it or not we just acknowledge your presence today God not as ordinary or common we honor your presence we choose to wrap our lives around it. Choose to prefer you and your way over our way. Because it's not ordinary. It's not common that a holy God would welcome us in. Sometimes I wonder if the gospel gets too familiar. Jesus Christ, Son of the Father, leaving his throne in glory. Taking on skin and bone, walking and associating with every pain, weakness, frailty, and sin, having nothing with it. Jesus Christ, God Himself, living among us as one completely misunderstood, abandoned by His friends, accused and tried doing nothing wrong ultimately hung on a cross next to two sinners beaten and hung to death a thorn in his side a crown on his head mocked all with the intention that that sacrifice would be the once and for all sacrifice that after that any sort of separation from God would be forgiven because of the atonement from that sin, from that sacrifice. I just wonder if that gets too common sometimes. Jesus Christ dying on behalf of the world for my sin. Better yet, he was buried in the grave on the third day he rose again to say that he would overcome death, hell, and the grave. He would overcome anything that you would attempt to exalt itself above him. He would, he'd always win that one because he's victorious. Just wonder if we've let things become too ordinary or common with the gospel. But Jesus Christ is still saving. He's still redeeming. He's still restoring. His blood is still sufficient. His body was still broken. You and I have access to apply the good news of Jesus. 
in every moment of every day. So Lord, I'm asking with all the hunger inside of me to restore honor to our lives. Choose to not just be people who honor you with our lips, but we actually honor you with our hearts, with the very core being who we are. In Jesus' name, thank you for it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope that that message was inspiring, encouraging, and hopefully equipped you for life. And if you're looking to get connected with Equippers Church, you can go to equipperscc.com slash connect, fill out a simple form, and someone from our team will be reaching out. You can find all kinds of opportunities to connect, to give, and receive prayer on our website, equipperscc.com. And hey, we really hope to meet you in person sometime, see you in the room. But until then, keep tuning in. We hope that you are blessed by Clippers Church here on YouTube. Love you so much. God bless.